welcome everybody to lecture six, information retrieval in the winter semester 22-23. Today's topic is uh, web applications. It's a two-part topic. Today is the first part. First, I will say something about your experiences with the last exercise sheet, which was about fuzzy search, in particular fuzzy prefix search. There will be no lecture on December 6 next week, which means you have two weeks for the next exercise sheet, and I will have a slide about it with more information. And the contents today is how to build a web application, so in particular a search web application, but what I will show you in the lecture is mostly a web application and we will build a whole web application from beginning to end and not using some library which does everything for us but really from the grounds up so with socket communication so talking between two machines and then you will learn all these concepts HTTP, media types, HTML style sheets and so on. So each individual thing which you see today will be relatively simple, but actually understanding how a web application works with these two machines and a browser and stuff being sent back and forth and the interaction, that's actually quite intriguing. And I believe that it's very good to understand this from the ground up, because if you just use some framework or library which does everything for you, you don't really understand it. And today you will understand it. And the exercise sheet will be to build a web application on top of the fuzzy search which you have done for the last exercise sheet. And what that means, uh, yeah, I will explain it to you. It will become clear during the course of the lecture. And this will be a yeah, this will also become clearer for this exercise sheet. You will do something static. So for those of you who know JavaScript, you will not yet use JavaScript. There will be enough other stuff. And then for the next exercise sheet in two weeks, you will add JavaScript to it and make it dynamic. You will be amazed by the result also already of your sheet for this week. You will be even more amazed by the result of your sheet uh, in two weeks. Okay, so how was your experience with the fuzzy search? It was a good experience, so most of you, almost all of you liked it a lot, found it quite doable. You also liked the topic, the explanations, and you were happy to be coding again. Here are some quotes, really cool exercise. Many of you said that it was impressive how much this data structure could speed everything up. Most interesting exercise, so happy to be coding again. But, as usual, there's a spectrum of opinion. I missed the math after the last two sheets. Coding rather easy, following the ideas was less stressful than the math sheets. Uh, somebody wrote that, uh, I wonder how many people feel like that. There was a very detailed explanation on the sheet how to do it. My impression is that most of you like that. We already had it in the past uh, in different ways with much less instructions but uh, my feeling is that many of you like it if it's more detailed, but then there's always the opposite opinion, that's life. Somebody says it's too much. And here we have a very competitive comment. So, how stressed are you? That was one question. So, I would say overall the stress level was normally distributed, slightly skewed towards the stressed side, I would say, but not especially so. Most of you opted for a break next week, so we are having a break next week with more information on the next slide. Here are some quotes. Would like a little break to revise all the topics. Told good call. I could use more time to get Christmas presents. Not stressed at all. Best time of the year. Cookies, Glühwein, chocolate. I'm fully relaxed at the moment, so there was the whole spectrum. I always liked Several people said that, oh no, yeah, a break is fine, but I don't want to miss. If we drop interesting material because of that, please don't have a break. So there were certainly 10 people saying that. Uh, some of you mentioned that the workload so far was just uh, fine. And uh, some people are also very stressed because it is a normal distribution. Yeah, and somebody said it would be amazing because it's their birthday on the next date. Okay, so these were your comments. So there will be no regular lecture on the next uh, week. 
which actually fits because this exercise sheet, if you do it nicely, it's a, it's a little more work, so you have two weeks for it. But what we will do, there will be a Q&A session and it will not be, uh, let me just show a little more, there will be no Q&A session this Friday and the next Friday. Instead, we will use the slot from the next lecture, the usual time. But let's start at a quarter past on December 6th by me, uh, because Natalie is at a conference. And then we can take as much or little time as you need. It will not be a lecture with new material. It will be likely online only, not recorded. Here's an agenda, but it's preliminary. You can tell me what you wish. Several of you said that you would like, like more, know more about mathematics. I mean, I'm doing this a little bit in the lecture, but I can't give a whole math lecture if the actual topic is something else. So in this Q&A session, I can spend a little more time on proof. How do, does one prove these little things? Where should one pay attention? And, and just all these math, these very basic math questions, we can talk about that. And as usual, I will do it with a lot of examples. So I think that will be very interesting for many. And then, of course, any questions you might have about this lecture, the past lectures, exercise sheet, past or current, and life in general. Yeah, and I hope to see many of you at this Q&A session. So, and there will be also a separate announcement in the forum. Okay, so that's it for the organizational part. There are no questions about this. You know you can always use the chat or, you, or your mouth or whatever. So let's start with the web application stuff. So web applications, we have uh, two machines talking, machines talking with each other, very futuristic. How does that work? So uh, yeah, it can be the browser. Okay, and, and if you have two machines talking with each other, you do that with uh, something called a socket. So each of the machine has to create a socket. It's like the <coughs> endpoints, which are then that was too loud. You can lift the chair more quietly. Thank you. So, and the socket always has two components because a machine can have, unlike humans, many conversations at the same time. Which and and how how's it done? Each machine has ports, so there are different ports on the same machine. So if two machines are talking, then each machine has the name of the machine and a particular port talking to the other machine at a particular port. And that's usually, uh, no, that's also too loud. You have to lift the chairs up, then move them in the air, and then put them down again, and then it's quiet. It's possible, I know, I've tried it. So the port is an integer number, and, and we will see that. So, but that's just, uh, you will see it live in a second. How does it work? How does uh, communication between two machines work? On the socket level, you have to create a socket, like here is something from which I can talk to another machine. You have to say, this is now port 8847 uh, on this machine. And then you listen for, now you, other people can call you like a phone call on that machine, on that port. And then you wait for something, you, you listen for what they have to say, then maybe you do some computation and then you send something back. And on the other side, it's, uh, it's very similar. So they also, they, no, it's not, it's, it's asymmetric. I mean, the server has the socket, the other side can now call this machine. It just needs to know the name of the machine and the port. And then, if it does that, we will see that you automatically get a port on that machine, which calls the other machine, and then you send something, you wait for the result. Okay, but that's just high-level stuff. We will do it low-level in a second, and then it will all become very clear. This is just, so in Python, we will use socket, that's built-in library, just for those of you who want to know. In Java, the standard library for this is Java Net Service Socket. In C++, you used Boost ASIO. You can e do it even more low level, but anyway, we won't do it in the lecture. And I don't think, is anybody in the room using Java or C++ for the exercise sheets? I don't think so, right? You're doing it all with Python. Python. 
and we will provide this code as a starting point for your exercise sheet and it will also be the starting point for our code today. Actually in the lecture today we will do a lot of live coding and we will do a lot of stuff which you also need for the exercise sheet but we will not give you that, we will just give you the starting point because especially for this topic if you just if you just copy the code and then ah yeah and, and you run it you don't understand it you have to do this yourself you, at least once you have to program a web server yourself and see in all these little steps what can go wrong and then how you fix it and then you understand it and you have some aha moments so it's really of course you will have the, the recording where you can see how did I do it but also there I would not recommend to just blindly copy but try to understand integrate it into your code do it step by step like we do in the lecture today this is just for reference this is where we will start from we will see it uh, uh, yeah and, and this is just for reference now I will go to uh, the coding now immediately thank you Frank everything works fine so far and I've prepared something here this is a Python script it's a little different setup today so this window is more narrow it's also one font smaller I hope you still have good eyes in the back row we tested it before it's still visible and this is I prepared some code to save some time so this is the code which was also on the slide let's maybe briefly look at it and go through it so it's a class which is called search server you initialize it with a port which means this program will Natalie can you just do it there's a pretty strong draft and I don't think yeah, it's it's much colder now so we danke It's a, it's a strong draft and then oh says okay so we are creating this socket here you don't have to understand the details it's now we want to start a server on the machine let's not go too much into the details of these commands there's comments here it's also on the slide <coughs> we want other machines to be able to call us so this argument says how should they call us maybe this machine here has several names so it's the machine called Tura but maybe they also call us under the name localhost or a fully qualified name it's in a particular network which also has a name and so on this just says zero this address means any name is fine and I will answer then binding which just means I will listen on that port and then I'm listening okay so now the socket is created we can just uh, let's just see how we will uh, so this is our search server which so far does nothing really I have to tell give it a port that's down here in the main program so uh, in the main program yeah the usage is I have to specify a port then it will create an object of this class with a given port and then it will run it will call this function and right now it does nothing <laughs> it just I created the socket which listens and uh, and that's it so now let's uh, go a little bit further so now we have a socket so how does this continue mm. the first thing one does with such a socket is uh, you listen listen for uh, yeah wait wait for connections uh, in an infinite loop that's the typical server loop so we have an infinite loop and I'm just uh, yeah so let's maybe first write something so that we see it and we are starting slow but there will be so let me use a formatted string so I'm waiting for connection on this will be for our log on port and this is self port let's see it's a little bit narrow so I don't have shouldn't write so much and how does it work so 
server. Let's look at it on the slide. Server socket accept. Yeah, it's accept. So what this does, accept means my socket is now waiting for phone calls from the outside on this port. And this will block, so the execution will block at this point. Actually, we can uh, check this if we run the program right now. So now the program is in very sad state, so it's waiting for somebody to call it, and nobody calls it. So that's where it is. So this is blocking, except this blocking. And when somebody calls it, it will return two things. It will return, uh, it's also written here, an object which we will use for the connection, and it will also return the address. So we can uh, afterwards write uh, connection incoming uh, client connected from. Let's see what's on the... Mm. Yeah, let's just, I don't know actually what kind of object this is, this address object, but let's just print it. Okay, but anyway, we will not get there if I now run it again, because nobody is uh, calling us. So how do we call this? And let's just, I will do this as follows. So in my editor, I can just actually let me first do it like this. I can just exit the editor for a moment, going to a shell. There's a program called Telnet, which is very old, which essentially just phones other machines on a given port. So let me just uh, do that. I just say, please phone this machine Tura. I'm actually on the same machine here, so I could also use localhost, but it doesn't matter. I could also phone from another machine. And please call it on port 888. And now something happened, right? You see here, client connected, so somebody called me. And it says here the address, okay, it's fine. So this was this uh, client address was a combination of, of an address. So the, the person, the machine that called me had this address 10.8.152.108. You can see that it's an internal address. It's not a public address, but a local network address, doesn't matter. And it also called me from some port. That's what I explained earlier. That's just a port that's created when you, when the client wants to talk to another machine. Okay, and then nothing happens because we haven't done anything. So now here I'm on the phone now. I called this uh, machine on the, on the right, and now I'm yeah. Hello. Nobody. So you see. Uh, Nothing happens, right? Because this uh, machine so has already moved on, right? It didn't do anything. So let's just uh, change that. So it's actually not so easy to exit Telnet because everything you type will be sent to the other machine. So I think, yeah, and let's go back to the editor. Okay, so the first thing we should do, now we have accepted the phone call, we should somehow process what we get from the other side. And this was also, and this is done by, uh, by this command, connection receive. It's, uh, it's called receive, called different in different libraries. I think in Python it's, it's called like that. Read a batch of uh, data mm. from the client. Okay. So the client is, is saying something, let's call that a request, and you have to, when you use that command, you have to say how much you are going to read. You don't know how much they are going to talk, right? So let's just take, I don't know, 64, maybe less. So let's just do that. And let's maybe have a variable here, request data. And now here's another thing that's important. What do I receive? Is it a string? No, it's actually not a string, and I'm not sure whether I... So this is stuff uh, that I did. It's just from the slide for references. This is something important for the whole lecture. Bytes versus strings. 
It's actually easy to understand, you just have to be aware of it. So whatever I set acr send across the network is sequences of bytes. It can be anything, it can also be an image or whatever, or something compressed, it can also be text, but fundamentally it's bytes. I get bytes from the other machine and I send back bytes to the other machine. So in Python, you can use bytes objects. There's also byte array if you want to change the bytes. Here we don't want to change the bytes. So we are just using bytes objects. And how does bytes object work in Python? You can use bytes, the keyword, but you can also just use the string notation and write a B in the front. And every other programming language has this too. Okay, so this is now just bytes, so really individual bytes. Then what's the difference to a string? Well, in a string, you have uh, you have characters, right? So here's a string, knödel, wonderful German word, knödel, and each letter here does not necessarily has a representation, which can use one byte, two byte, three bytes, we don't know. And for example, in UTF-8, which we will talk about in the next lecture, an Ö actually is represented, this German umlaut thing, represented in two bytes. Some characters need three bytes, four bytes, even more bytes depending on the encoding. So what I've specified here is an encoding, saying how are characters represented in bytes. You don't need to understand that in depth for this exercise sheet. You just have to understand that there's a difference between bytes and strings. And you have to convert between the two. Because I'm sure, uh, and also we today, you will get these error messages uh, where it says, look, I'm expecting a string here. You're giving me bytes or vice versa. So the two commands which uh, Python provides for this is encode and decode. Why is it called like this? Encode means I have a string, and now I have to say, how should I turn this into bytes? How do I, how is the, uh, these letters encoded? So here I'm saying encoded using this correspondence of characters to bytes, and then I get the sequence of bytes. So that's string to bytes, and the other direction is the same. So here I have two bytes, I can specify them like this. We don't need this today. If I want to specify bytes explicitly, I can do this in hex notation here. And this would actually be the German umlaut Ö in UTF-8. So here this would have as contents one character, length one, although it's two bytes. So encode and decode, we will yeah, for this lecture, we will always assume UTF-8. Actually, in Python, if you omit the argument here, it's automatically UTF-8 because that's just the standard encoding for nowadays because it's uh, very universal and, and just standard. And we will have a whole part in the next lecture in two weeks where I will explain to you how UTF-8 works because it's really interesting to uh, important to understand. So for now, we will just... Our request is just binary data, and let's just uh, mm -hmm. let's just uh, print it. Uh, batch of yeah. Anyway, data batch. Let's just print it. I'm not sure whether. And here I have to. Yeah, maybe I do it like this. This was just request data. And I'm going slow in the beginning it because it will get more complicated very quickly. So let's see what I get now. And now I'm not going to the shell. Actually, I can invoke commands from the shell by just using in Vim. I can just use the uh, exclamation mark and I can here go Tura888, I can call it from here. So now I'm temporarily in a terminal. So you see now it's waiting here. It's not going to the next except because it's actually calling receive. So uh, if I now type uh, hello, okay. But now after the hello, it uh, went to the next one. Okay, uh, if I now type anybody, uh, talking to me, nobody talking to you. So 
I'm doing this low level so that you see what kind of complications can arise, right? It's asynchronous now. This already moved on to the next listening for the next connection. Here I'm still talking. And if you imagine this side, I mean, this side doesn't know what's happening on that side, right? So all kinds of complications arise and you will be confronted with that when you try to solve the exercise sheet. So it's something one has to understand when, when you have these two machines talking with each other asynchronously a lot of things can go wrong. So let me uh, show you one more thing. <laughs> How do I exit this? Quit, yeah, now I'm back here. So let's actually do this again. And now let's uh, maybe type something more. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, this didn't send any everything now, right? It just read 64 bytes and I read a lot of things here. So the next thing that we should do, and that's just important to understand, that you have to read in rounds. You can't just read everything at once because you don't know how much the other side is going to talk. Yeah, maybe it's a very talkative relative and sending, I don't know, gigabytes. So what you have to do is uh, read in rounds and there's no way around that so there's no receive everything because you don't know when they are going to stop talking <laughs> so you have to do that so let's do it like this and now we need uh, another while loop here while true and uh, and now let's just uh, press data batch that's just a batch now. Batch. Yeah, let's call it data batch because we don't have such long lines today. Data batch. And now let's just uh, append this to our request data. And we'll remove all these uh, debugging output request data. I can just, this is append. I think there's also extend, but let's just do it like this. Okay. And now the question, of course, is <laughs> how do we exit this loop? But let's just try it. Let's go slow in the beginning. So let's, and here, of course, I have to restart the server. Now I have, and now let's call again. And now let's, uh, hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you talking to me? Hmm. Apparently not. So the other side is, and, uh, yeah, so I'm doing something here. The other side gets something there. Let's, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm still sending something here. Hello, yeah, nobody. Okay, it goes on like this. Now let's see what happens when I close the connection. Ah, let's quit. Okay. What's happening now? This is still running. What's happening? You see, that's also an interesting effect, and I wanted to show you that this is now running on and on and on, and what's happening? This side has now uh, put up, put down the receiver, not talking anymore. And when this happens, uh, that's just by definition, then what you get here has length zero. So when it's length zero, you can break the loop. This is what we just saw. So if... Uh, yeah, let me just put it here. So if the length of this data batch, and this is something which you can uh, rely on. So when the length of this data batch is zero, then you can break the loop. It means the other side stopped, uh, ended the connection. They hung up. And note that it happened. Uh, let me also show that again. Let me start the server again. And this is, there are a lot of subtleties here, and there are even more subtleties which I don't talk about. So even with this very simple talking to each other, there are so many things which can happen and which can go wrong. So actually I'm, okay, now I'm down here. How do I, let me, yeah. <coughs> the interesting, what did I want to show when I, <coughs> 
Now I just stopped sending something. I haven't ended the connection. Right? This is not putting down the receiver, right? This is just, uh, just here when I quit. Now I'm putting down the receiver. Now the connection has been closed from this side. Even says it here, connection closed. Okay, so now let's uh, send something back. Uh, what would happen yes? if Telnet would crash, if you would uh, type in um, control C or something like this and crash it? Yeah, you can't type in control C because in Telnet everything you type will be sent as a character. But you, can, you have another sequence. Yeah, what will happen? That's a... Uh, I mean, the connection will just end, right? It will be... No, it's a good question. The question is how... Then I need a third window, I think, right? To Yeah, l let's maybe save this for later, but it's a very good question. Or you can try it out yourself. The question is if this somehow crashes in the middle of, uh, of sending a request. And I'm actually not quite sure whether this site will... I think this site will also receive a connection ends. It will not be hanging. But it's, it's very good that you asked this because it's a, there are scenarios where something just hangs. The other side just doesn't say anything anymore and then the other side doesn't know what's up, whether they have ended the connection or they've just died or whatever. So it's a very good question. But I don't know the answer right now. We could try it, but I think it would cost maybe too much time. I would need a third window. So let's just uh, handle the request in a separate function. And this is the function we will... Yeah, let's just... Uh, mm -hmm. Which returns... Oh, this is... I wanted to... Mm -hmm. Which returns the... Which is we send back. Okay, so now let's... So there's a... Um, <coughs> handle request. And this is... Uh, oh, it's like this. And now we give it the request data. And this should uh, return something. So when we handle the request, typically we will listen to what was sent to us. We do something, we send something back. So let's uh, write that method now. And let's, uh, so this is now handle request. This is a member of the class. So, and then we have the request data. Yeah, and let's just write a comment here. Let's maybe put it to the top. So, uh, yeah, do handle uh, yeah, process and return a message. So let's just do that. Let's do something very simple for now. So let's, uh, so message is, uh, yeah. Thank you for, let's also use a format. Thank you for, let's just, I think it's always very polite to say thank you. Thank you for this uh, and uh, let's put a new line here so that you see and then Please send more. I think that's a very polite way. Yeah. So I'm totally ignoring the other person, but I'm saying thank you. Please send more. Yeah. I'm. But it's uh, polite. So what do I do now? No, now I have the message here, and we will everything else we will be doing in the rest of the lecture will happen in this handle request function. Let's just see how that works. Now I have to send it back. That's actually easier than the receiving because now I know what I have. I can just say send all. And now I have to pay attention because now my message is actually a string and I want to send it back as a as a byte sequence and for this I need encoding. So I 
This is what I already explained. So let's just let's just see whether it works. So I just received the request here. This method just constructs a simple message for now, and then I send it back. And then I should uh, yeah, send. Shouldn't it be in the while loop? Oh, definitely not. No, it should not be in the while loop. Okay. The while loop is reading the request data in bits. I, it could also be very small bits, like one byte at a time. This is just a random parameter. I'm just reading what I in packets until there is no more to read, until the batch size is zero, and then I have the full request. Look, I'm extending the request here. The request just comes in batches. This while loop is not many requests, but it's one request in many bits. Is that but clear? That when uh, the batch size is zero, the connection is closed. That means you can't answer, or am I understanding the concept uh, wrong? Yeah, that's a very good question. We will come back to that. When is the connection? Yeah, very good point. Let's come back to that in a minute. You are having a point there. But let's first uh, see it in action, and then I think it will become clearer. So uh, we should close the connection when we are done. So our communication, so this is now very simple communication. I get something, I compute something, I send something back, and then we are done. Connection close. So let's see how this works now. For now, and let's... Uh, Uh, actually, ah, yeah, that's good. Now I get an empty screen, and let's do. Mm -hmm. So, hello. Okay, I don't. Uh, are you talking to me? Mm -hmm. So actually, I have to end this now. Mm -hmm. And now I. So nothing happens, I'm not getting a result yet, and that's actually exactly what you said, right? Because the connection is not yet closed. The connection is not... So, so it looked natural, but you spotted it, but this, what we did is wrong, right? I mean, I stopped sending something, but I haven't closed the connection yet. But when I close the connection, then I'm, yeah, I'm not there to uh, receive something. But okay, now I've made a mistake, so that's... Where's my mistake? Cell handle request request data. I mean, this is this is unrelated. The error message here. Can you please tell me the line number? In seventy-two, what did? Can you say that again? The what is wrong? Oh, yeah, thank you. The indentation is wrong. You are absolutely right. But why doesn't it complain? Yeah, it's just, yeah, it was just stupid. Thank you very much. So we do it again. And maybe I now do reset, just resets the screen so that it's at the top. So Telnet, Tura, 8888. Blah. Okay, and now uh, let's try again. Hello. Blah. Okay, now I'm saying, okay, let me stop sending something. I've sent something. Now I quit the connection. Ah, now I have another problem. None type has no attribute encode. What's, what did I do wrong now in line 66? Can you say that again? Yeah, thank you. You can uh, say it right away when you spot it. Thank you. So we also need to... So we try again, but you will have, of course, the same problems when you do this, but it's all very instructive. So let's do it again. And now we are not so talkative anymore. Blah, blah. Okay, now let's uh, quit. You get to know Telnet very well. Nothing happens because the connection is still on. And now we, 
Yeah, now we have closed the connection and now the result is sent to something which is no longer there. So apparently uh, this doesn't work. And uh, there's a good reason for this. And the reason is the following. A connection is not the same as sending a result back and forth, but a connection is something which can last for a longer time. Actually, we will switch to web browsers in a second. You can just have the line open, and now you want a back and forth. I say something, you say something, and then I say something again. So I have to signal that, OK, I'm done now with my message. Now you can send something. And this is just something you have to negotiate. You have so, for example, when you talk to each other on the phone, it's typically a short break or something, which indicates, OK, I'm finished. Usually you don't say end of message, you can speak now. You have these uh, culture-dependent hints. But here we just have to agree on something. And let's do something which the protocol we will talk about in a second also does. We, let's just agree if I send an empty line, a line with nothing on it, and actually, you can see here that the new lines here are two characters, so always uh, carriage return and new line. So if our if I have uh, yeah, if my request data mm, and how do I do that? Find match. What's the right? Let me just. So I always have a new line, and this I think means I have an empty, empty line. So if I have something like this, or I could even say probably ends with. Now let me just say say it like this. Then I. Then I break the loop. Let's just try this. What whether it works? So let me try it again. Hello. Hmm. What if I then? Ah, you see, this is the error message you will also get a lot. Now I have uh, request data is binary, and this is looking for a string. This doesn't work, and I don't get this at compile time because Python doesn't know the types at compile time. I have to do binary here, right? This is binary, so this has to be of the same type. Anyway, we can speed up a little now because we have seen these things many times now. Uh, so, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you see. Thank you for hello. Please send more. Connection closed by foreign host. Done. Okay, that s sounded polite at first, and then it was a bit harsh. And maybe I also s should send a new line here. Okay, so this is now our uh, protocol, and let's do it again one more time. So I can, but actually I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Why did it break, even though it didn't find, I didn't enter a, an empty line here. So I'm not sure I understand why, why I did that. Does anybody understand it? I'm confused myself now, right now. Do you have an idea? Because this was not in my data and still. No, no, I'm getting, this is the data I received here, so I don't know why it received. The return value of... Uh, of uh, find. Oh, of find, it's minus one. Yeah, I think I did, when I tried this, I didn't use find, but yeah. So it's, it's, oh yeah, fine just gives me the position, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. But is, is there another, is there a match, or is there, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but I think that's the reason, okay. So this was a Python thing thingy. Hello, okay. Are you 
talking to me. Okay, now it works fine. I'm sending something. It's collecting the data. Now I'm done sending. Now I have to... Uh, okay, now I typed an, an empty line and now it just appended all this and now it... Okay, but now it, it worked. Now I can do it again. Actually, I don't have to restart my server, right? I can just do it again here. So now I'm... Uh, yeah, hello, blah, blue, blee. So I can talk, it will just uh, collect the data and once I type this, then, then it's uh, done. So my, con my convention now is I type an empty uh, line and then the other side knows and then it just responds with what it has collected so far. Okay, great. So we have established something that works, a basic back and forth. Our server is still running. Now let's do the following. Let's go to a web browser, and this is the first, this is the next step now. Let's just enter uh, this here. So I just enter the name of the machine and the port with a colon in between, and you see something is happening. So now I also got something. And actually I can look at what I just got by looking at, I'm typing F12 here, which tells me what the, what the browser was doing. So actually it was sending something here to the other machine. So what happens in a browser, and this is something you should understand in case you didn't know it yet, I type a host name and a port in the browser and maybe something else after it. We'll come to that in a second. And the effect of this is, is the same as for Telnet. It's just sending something to that machine on that port. It's just calling that machine on that port. And as you can see, it's sending a lot of information here. And maybe let's now, to, to understand this a little bit better, let's now print this a little bit nicer. So here I was just showing you the batches. I don't think we need to see the batches now, but let's just uh, print the... Uh -huh. Request uh, received. And let's just do it like this. And actually I don't want the... And what's my, my request data? That's why I collected it. And let's now just decode this in. Hmm, how do I do it? Maybe like this. Request data decode UTF-8. OK, now I will not uh, show it in, in bits, but I will just so show the whole thing after I've received this. Let's just see how it looks like. Let's start again here. Let me go to my browser again and let me... Bam. Okay. And as you can see, by just typing this in the browser in the address bar and pressing return, it actually sent me this whole thing here. And here I have the new line and another new line I probably printed. And let's just see Actually here, if in this browser window, the browser also tells me what it did. Actually, it tells me that it sent uh, this to the machine. And if you look at it, it looks suspiciously similar to what we have here, right? The browser just, this is, it just tells me if I open this console here with F12, it's on the, on the slides, it just tells me what it sent to the other machine. So it sent this. We will not look too much into these individual headers, but that's just the request the browser sends. And here we receive this. And for the rest of the lecture, we're actually only interested in this very first line. The rest of the line we can ignore for now. And what's the very first line? What's the typical thing you enter in a browser? Typically you enter a host. You typically don't enter the port that's implicitly 80 if you don't uh, type something. Here we will specify the port, sometimes you see it. And then you enter something like this, search HTML, right? And what, what's the effect of this? The effect is 
that it sends this line here and then a lot of other stuff. So it just sends this and so I get this path here after the, I get it in my request. And for the rest of this lecture, let's just print this first line so that it's uh, a little more easier to see. So, uh, uh, for this lecture, we are just interested in the first line of the request. So how do we do this? We just uh, take our our request and we uh, yeah let's just decode it. Do we want to decode it? Yes, I think we do. And let's just split it. Mm. Yeah, by these characters, and then we want the, I think that's one way to do it. We want the first entry. Oh my. Oh, this was a key combination which uh, exits. I'm sorry. And now I'm not sure whether have to be a bit more. Does this work in Python or do I need a continuation now? I'm not sure. Request data received. Let me just put the request here. So now what I try to do is just extract the first line. I'm not sure whether it will... I'm a bit unsure here whether that... Let's just try it. Yeah, that looks good. So strangely enough, it also asked uh, another th something here, which I, this is actually the icon which it wants to display in the tab here. We will come to that uh, later. So it's actually sending two requests here. And let's just look at the network tab again. So here, and if I look at it in raw form, what I now get here is just the first line and it's called a get request and what it just contains is the keyword get and then it contains everything after the slash here and then some information about the protocol which for today's lecture is HTTP 1.1. Okay, so let's see if there's something else on the slide for... Actually, where are my slides? I left them. Okay, so what, let's quickly go through something which we have already seen now. Ah, we have not yet spoken. Okay, we have seen the first part of HTTP. The, so the browser is now talking to us and it also has to follow some protocol. I already mentioned that uh, you somehow have to say when you are done with sem sending something, you do that with this uh, new line. And uh, it sends us get requests. And a get request is just a string of this form. So it's just the keyword get, then whatever comes after the slash in the address bar, and the rest we ignore. And now we are supposed to uh, send something back. And uh, I think uh, we will do that now or after the break. Maybe we will send something back. Let me just go through the next. Uh, slide. Yeah. Let's do the sending something back and then we have a break. Ah, okay. Thank you for... Okay. I'm already sending something back, actually. Let me not send the request data, but the request... And uh, let me also call it request here, because it's, uh, yeah. So just the first line, I'm just, uh, now I'm just processing the first line and sending it back. Okay, so now what we send back. 
And you can see it here what happened in this network tab of the, of the browser console. So it uh, sent this here, these headers, of which we also only uh, ignored everything except for the first line. And then this is the response which it received and which we will then cho just show in the, in the browser window. <coughs> and actually, I didn't adhere to the protocol right now because I'm supposed to send some headers to tell the browser what this is, what I sent. So I'm a bit surprised that I, I don't get any error messages. But let's do that now and, and, and after that have the break. So what you are supposed to do when you send something via this protocol, you get it like this and you should send it like this. So you do not just send your content, so the browser could have just ignored what I sent, but you have to send some headers with some information. So the first line should be whether, uh, mm, yeah, just a status code, so 200 means everything works fine. Then you have to send the length of the data you're going to send, so it would be the length of our message, and then you have to say what type it is. So let's just do it and we will talk about more about that later. Let's just do it for now. So actually here, let's just our handle request return two things. It's the... Uh, hmm, how do we... Yeah, let me first write the handle request and then you... Okay, let me... So here I have a status and let me just say the status is 200 OK. I have a type, and let me call that media type. I have a slide on this, which is for now text, text plane. I have a slide on this, I will explain it in a second. And let me just return all three, I'm not sure, maybe in the order in which uh, they appear in the header. So it's the media type and the message. So I'm just returning three pieces of information now, which I have to read here. Status, media type, message is equal to And now let me send it properly. So I have to send uh, HTTP 1.1 and then the status. And then a new line. A new line should always look like this. And if I concatenate string and Python, I can just uh, do it like this, just writing strings next to each other. And I have to say content length. Now I need the, okay, that's the length of my message. So it's len message. And actually my message, I have to make sure that my message is uh, data, right? So let me do the following if, um, so actually now I'm returning a string here. So in case my message is, uh, of type string. I think that's the way you do it in Python. I'm not quite sure if you know it better. Please correct me. Let's just turn it into message into a byte sequence. This is what I explained earlier. So if it's a string encoded, if it's already data, then uh, I don't need to encode it. It's already uh, okay. So now I can just do the length of my message here. I send this and uh, the content type, I'm sorry, and this is the media type. This will be the text plane for now. I'm just sending the browser, this is plain text and nothing else. And then what's not here on the slides, maybe I should write it with my pen. If I, oh, this is entangled now with my mouse. What comes here is uh, 
there must be an empty line here. ended by this sequence again. And this is just so that the uh, browser knows, OK, these are the headers, and now comes the contents, because there can be many more headers. So you somehow have to say, OK, when do my headers stop? And you just do this by having an empty line, like we already did before. So let me just do it like this. Let me also write it in a separate line here. And now let me just, uh, OK, the message is now. This is now a string. I have to encode it in. I also have to turn it into bytes again. So let me just do it like that. And now I add the message. Ah, I have a subtle question here. Why? Why did I do it differently? Why did I first encode the message now and add it here? What would have gone wrong if I would have done it the other way around? Like encode it here and not encode it there before. What's the difference? Do you see the difference? The length might yeah, the length might change, exactly. That's a very dangerous mistake here, right? If I would have done the encoding here, then this would have been the length of the string. And the length of the string is not the number of bytes. So many pitfalls. Yes, so this is actually very important. So let's uh, try what we get now, if it compiles. OK. Ah, oh, nice. Now we, now we have some response headers here, which weren't there before. So this is actually what it received. So this is also what the browser expects. So it was a miracle that it showed something before. It wasn't supposed to. It did it anyway. Now it received proper headers. It now, ah, this, you are following the protocol. You sent me something which is 57 bytes long. And it had this content type. So now I actually talked. The browser called me. I talked back to the browser according to HTTP protocol. And as you can see, it's actually very simple, right? It's just reading strings. It's just a line. And then you send back some lines in the proper format, and then the browser. So it's a very simple protocol. And I think that's it for the first half. So we make a break now. Are there any questions for now? Maybe you can think about questions in the break. And then we do more sophisticated stuff after the break. So see you in five minutes. <coughs> so what we have seen now, what the, the browser sent a GET request, and that what's, that's what happens when you type something in the address bar and send something. The HTTP protocol knows a lot more request types, like POST request. This is when you went to send uh, data along with the URL. This does not happen when you type something into the browser, but you can also use it in, in different contexts. We don't need it here. Many other request types. There are also many more headers, uh, in this case, result headers, which you can send. For example, we, we just sent uh, 200 OK. You can also send not found, forbidden. Actually, you can send any header you like. Let me just uh, make that clear. For example, here, I can also do send. Let me just take 200 blah blah. Let's see what happens then if the browser complains. Yeah. Now it just says status 200 blah blah. It's also OK. So actually, you see, this is a very <laughs> basic format. So actually, yeah, I can just write there whatever I want. It's really just strings. Some of it are given meaning. The string after the number, actually, the browser doesn't care. And it's just a convention that you use certain codes for certain events. And for the exercise sheet, you should implement these. And what this means will become clear in the following. We have already seen these media types or content types. They are called in the 
H in the HTTP headers. They used to be called MIME types because this first came up in the context of mail. When you have mail, in a mail you have text, but you can also attach all kinds of things, images, PDF, what, what not, and then you have to say this piece of data is of this kind of data. And that was called a MIME type at the time. So nowadays one calls it media types. And uh, there's just convention how these things are called. They typically consist of two parts. It's actually a bit more complex, but that's uh, the, the most fundamental part here. The, the first thing tells you what kind is this. So is it text, for example? And then the second part is just more specific. So there, that's the semantics, that's the, the format or the, the kind of data. So actually we'll use several of these today, not all of them. Yeah, and, and we, so far we just said we were just sending text. And, and this tells the browser how it should interpret the data. We will see that in a second. We have already seen the console, that's very useful. It will be very useful for the exercise sheet. Usually you don't have this open in a browser. You just <laughs> type something in the address and you enjoy the contents. But here, and this will also be valuable in, in two weeks, you can see exactly what's going on. It's a very, very valuable tool when you want to understand what's going on, when you want to debug and so on. Actually, here you can see everything, the raw data which the browser sent to our server here and what it received and all kinds of interesting stuff. There are also timing information, how long did it take and so on. Here it's on the same machine, so it's very fast. Yeah, it's usually F12 is the key combination on all the browsers. So here I'm on Firefox. It doesn't really matter. The browsers are very similar in this respect. The most important section for us now is the network section here, which just tells you what is being sent back and forth because that's the topic of today's lecture. There's also this console here. This will be important when we do JavaScript, not for now, and uh, elements which, uh, yeah, if you want, we'll come to that if we have HTML and we want to look at the elements of the page. Okay, let's now go to HTML. What is HTML? Well, usually you don't see contents like this in a browser. It looks more fancy with a bit more layout. And so you need a language to specify, please show this. Uh, this is a header, this is an image please show this in this way, and the language for that is HTML. I will not give you an HTML tutorial now, but we will just write an HTML document together, and just I explain some, I mean, it's a very simple markup format. So let me start by writing the body here. There's also a head, which I will write in a second. For example, I can, uh, this is a title, so it uses this tag notation here, so it comes from the XML world, so this is just, I'm enclosing this piece of text in these H1 tags, and what H1 means, this is a header, a first level header, and this just gives the browser a hint how it should display it, and you already see an abstraction here, it doesn't say here, please show this in Helvetica 14 point, it just says this is a header, and then there's another layer of abstraction with default values in the browser which says, okay, header, I will show it in this font, in this size, and so on. So let's just keep it that simple for now, and uh, so that's a simple HTML page. And there should also be a head with some meta information, for example, the title. Now what's the title in the, where does this appear? Yeah, let's see where it appears by just writing something there. So that's metadata, and we will see in a second where that appears. So that's a very simple HTML page which, which has some metadata, the title, we don't know yet where it appears, and then to show it's just a, a heading, our first search engine. Oh. 
Yeah, thank you very much. It's also an interesting question. What does the browser do when you mistype stuff here? Typically ignores it. It will try to display it as best as it can. Okay, now how do we return this to the browser? We haven't done this yet, so that's what we will do next. What we actually want is, I mean, for now we have just programmed something which just says thank you to whatever. Thank you for this request. Please send more. Now comes another element of abstraction. How do browsers work? And, and maybe you haven't realized this before. Maybe you have. What this says here, please, on your machine to which I'm talking now, on Tura888, please look if there is a file, search HTML, and return its contents to me. That's how this protocol started. That's the, but that's semantics, right? That's just the meaning I'm attaching to this. So I just take this as a file name, I look for it on my machine, and if I find it, I return it. So let's just program that now together in our request handler. So, yeah, let's just, uh, yeah, check. And the first thing we should do, actually, we get this request here. Let's just extract the part in the middle. So let's... Uh, so, uh, yeah, we only uh, handle get requests. Let's do it like this. And let me be a little bit faster now. So, if this uh, request does not start with, uh, and I'm not sure, starts with you, you have to correct me if I'm doing something wrong here. It should start like this. Then we just say return the status is, I don't know, 403 forbidden, you can also write something else, go away, media type, text plain, and then uh, a message, maybe we only support get requests, okay, and let me just write some, yeah, I have to be, so, yeah, so now we have a GET request, let's go on, so uh, extract the, the path after the, that's called the path, so after this GET thing, oh my, I've mistyped here, how do we do that, let's, I mean, there are some spaces here. Let's just try the following path is request. Let's just split by space. Actually, the path does not contain spaces. And let's just take, yeah. Let's maybe uh, print it to check whether it works. Path, path. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just... Uh, that will do, a, I think you have understood the backup uh, setup by now, so let's just, yeah, so the path is, I've now extracted the path, and it, uh, and actually let me check whether the other thing also works by just, uh, another way to talk to such a server is with uh, curl or curl, I can just send it a request via curl, so I'm now on the same machine, so I can also I can also do it with uh, Tura888, search HTML. See, this also works. And now, so this is just a command to send something to another machine, a command line, CURL. I think you, who knows CURL, curl, who has heard it before? Oh, only relatively, okay. You have at least heard it before. Now, CURL, I can also use it to send uh, other so here I can send it as a post request, not as a, as a get request. Let's see what's happening. Now I get, we only support get requests. So I get that information. And, and here you can see it just said post instead of get. And there will also be a accompanying data if I want. But that's just on the side. Okay, so the path was, uh, was uh, extracted successfully here, so now let's uh, check whether 
a file with that name exists? And if so, uh, return its contents. So yeah, let me move that a bit to the top. How do I check if um, now I have to? Okay, let me just remove the trailing with that name uh, without the trailing slash. It always starts with a slash, so let's just remove that. And now let's, uh, how do we do it? I think the easiest way to do it is just, let's just open the file, right? Let's just try to open it for reading and do something, yeah, and then, okay, message is, uh, <coughs> And how do I read from a file? As, actually I'm not sure. Let me just file read. Does this read the whole contents? You can check it I if it's wrong. It reads only one line. Say it again. It reads, it reads only one line. I'm not sure. Are you sure? Accept, and if this doesn't work, let's just, uh, yeah, let's just deal with that case, okay, let's just do it like this. Then the code continues. If something doesn't work, we can just return. Yeah, let's just say uh, not found. Not found. We have already have this nice interface here and let's just uh, text plain. Ah, actually, I don't need, a, and I don't have to send a message actually when I Okay, so now my message is, uh, is actually the contents of the file. And maybe we can revert from blah blah to the more correct okay. So what did we do? I now just checked whether this thing here, which I received after the get, is a file without the trailing slash. I'm looking for that file on my machine. If I find it, I read it. And that's now my message, which I send back. Let's see, is there a mistake in here? If you see any mistakes in here, you should tell me. Otherwise, we just try. Okay, there's already a mistake. Oh, that mistake was that I typed something extra here. Okay, let's see, I'm curious myself. Oh yeah, it worked. Wow, it did work. Let's look in the network tab here. It worked on the first try, it sent something. And it received, oh no, that was the wrong one. It received the HTML. Now this doesn't look like the typical web page, right? So strange, Why, what's, what went wrong? What? Yeah, it shows us the source code. Why, what did we do wrong? Any ideas? Hmm? Media type, I hear the word media type. Yes, exactly. This was on the previous slide, so Somehow you have to tell the browser how to interpret it. Maybe you wanted to show this, right? Maybe this was the request, show me this file in its raw form. But somehow the convention in browsers is that when you have HTML, you don't show it in raw form, but you interpret it as, as HTML. And this is what the media types are for. So how do we do that? Well, I mean, we can just use a convention, and the convention is let's just look at the suffix of the file. If it's HTML, then we just take that as the media type. So let's just do if, and let's maybe do it like this. If media type ends with uh, dot .html, then the media type is text HTML. It's still text we are sending, we are not sending image data or something bytes. I mean, this is text, but it should just be interpreted as HTML. Can you say it again? 110? I think that's correct, yeah. Thank you for paying attention. 
And let's just start our server again. Let's see what happens. Wow, amazing. So our first search engine. Okay, it works now. We have sent HTML. It shows it as HTML. It's amazing. So let's uh, see this again. And here I can also, here actually I have a switch usually, which shows me the raw data or the interpretation. So that's the raw data, the HTML or the interpretation. Okay, now I will not give you an HTML primer. Just, I mean, this I've already explained. There's this meta information. Actually, we were wondering about the title. Just, and, and we just wrote something there. Where does this appear? Well, where does it appear? Here, in the tab, right? That's the thing which you see if you have several tabs or the, and actually the whole window because it only has one tab also has this. Where does this appear? So the title is what's shown. It's, it's meta information about the page. It's up to the browser how it does display it, but that's how it does display it. Okay, great. So, yeah, there is a, uh, more stuff here. There are all these, uh, of course, there it's a whole language, HTML. I'm not going to give you a tutorial here. Just a few elements, a level one header, if you want a paragraph, input field, we are going to do that now. An arbitrary logical section, something which belongs together but without uh, uh, semantic information, it's just a diff. You can look that up when you design your page. Let's just do the following. We want an input field. We want to input something. So, uh, and let's give it a certain size and let's just see how it looks like. And we can do it like uh, that. Input size. Yeah, let's just do that. Oh, and actually now. Now I've changed the HTML file. I don't need to restart the server, right? Our server, I haven't changed something in our server. I've just changed this file and I do a reload. My server is still running and now I get this wonderful input field. Let's also add a... Actually, I'm... What's the type of this thing? Text? I'm not sure. Is it type? I'm not so firm in... Here I want another button and I want it to be a, a search button. I think uh, that's the way to do it. These things after the tag are called attributes. Let's just see. I d oh yeah, it's missing a quote. We could see what happens when you miss a quote. Nothing probably. Okay, great. And let's also add a paragraph. Mm -hmm in uh, 1990s look and feel. Yeah? So that's a very, that's how the web pages, the first web pages look. And then uh, why does it, the Empress end is shown in red here. Let's just show and see what it does. Yeah. So yeah, that's our 1990s web page, but it is a web page. So for the exercise sheet, you, it's part of the task to have some some styling, some design. We will come to that in a second. Why is the Empress end shown here? Actually, the Empress end has a semantics. The browser chose to display it anyway. You have to escape this. So this is the proper way to do this. This is just in HTML. If you want to show this special character, it's just AMP, special characters, HTML entities just on the side. It will do exactly the same thing. And note how I didn't restart our server here, right? I just... Okay. So now, the next thing, of course, is, I mean, the exercise sheet will be to connect this somehow with your... what you did for the last exercise sheet. Before that, okay, one more thing. Uh, yeah, we want some styling information. So, that's where the, let me just quickly show that to you. That's also something for the head. Here I can say, if I want to associate certain styles, like colors with certain elements, I do that uh, here. And this has, yeah, this is a style sheet. 
I have to specify the media type here, it's text CSS. And, uh, okay, I have to give it an address. So I have to specify a file, which I call search.css. And let me write that file here as well. And in that file I can now say, for example, this paragraph or all paragraphs, let me show them in blue. So as I said earlier, HTML, these tags are just semantic information. This is a first level heading. Now I could say here, first level heading, please show them in 40 point size and in red and in bold face. The browser has default settings, but I can override them here. So here I'm saying, please show paragraphs in blue. And let's just do that and see what happens. And it actually did it. It showed it in blue. And look what happened here. Now I have search CSS here, and I have it twice. Actually, I don't know why I have it twice. But why did that happen? And you're seeing that a lot of magic happening here. I don't know why this appears. This is uh, a bit annoying. Why is that there? Oh, now it's gone. The browser gets this, it interprets this as HTML, and in the head it says, look, I want to use a style sheet, and the style sheet has this name. So what it does is, because of this line, when it interprets the HTML, it issues another GET request. And because it's so excited for some reason, it issues it two times. Who can explain to me why it uh, issues it two times? I don't know. Let me see, there's a question. Why does the port of the client change? Ah, that's interesting, right? The port of the client change. Yeah. Does it change all the time? Yes, it changes all the time. Yeah, and the reason for that is, that's a very good question, and that's also why I output it here. That's th because the way we implemented our server is, we get one request, like search HTML, then we process it, and then we close the connection. We don't have to do that. Actually, we could keep the connection open for longer and just, okay, you ask something, I send you something, you ask something, and I just keep it open. And actually, that's what the browser would like, and you could, can see it here. Then when, when it's here, when I look at the headers, it says, uh, connection, keep alive, there's this header, but we just ignored it. It says, please, uh, I'm, I want to send more stuff over this connection. But I'm just closing it after each request, and then it has no choice, so the browser, depending on the browser, it could also have problems now, but this browser is intelligent enough to then just start a new connection. And whenever you start a new connection on this machine, this is also running on a machine, <coughs> it has to find a new port. And as you can see, it's using a new port every time. It's not reusing previous ports, although the previous ports would be free again. So it's interesting. Interesting also that it increases by two. I don't know why. And it's not reusing the old ones. After some time it will, but I think the operating system needs some time to free them. But you see a lot of interesting things going on. It's really interesting to understand them when you code it yourself. If you just use a library, li you, you don't see all that and you don't uh, understand it. Okay, so what's the next thing? So now we have styled our HTML page. Now, yeah, CSS, there's also, it's a whole language, so to say. Uh, you can do everything, you can even do animations. CSS is very powerful, so it's just styling a web page. And yeah, Every website has uh, heavy CSS nowadays. And why? Let me just explain one more thing. It's a very nice abstraction that in the HTML you just show the contents and it's semantic. So you say, this is an input field, this is a button, this is a header, and how it looks like is in a separate file, right? It's a nice separation of semantics. Here's the contents, here's how it looks like. And that's why it's in two separate files, so, yeah. 
and it will be part of the exercise sheet to write to a nice style sheet. It, it's not hard to find documentation. It's a very easy language. Actually, when we are done with this, then we are done, so it's not too much more content. Now, what's missing? Well, right now, uh, I'm getting a bit confused with all the windows here. Yeah, uh, let's uh, write something here. I mean, nothing is happening. We have a search button here. We can click on it, but nothing happens. We haven't given it any functionality. Now, the usual way, way nowadays would be to have some code in the HTML JavaScript, which says when you click on the button, do this or that. For this exercise sheet, we will do it the old-fashioned way. And the old-fashioned way was to have a form. So for those of you who were already alive when the web was started, you would have all these pages with form. And let's just see what happens when you and then actually for the, uh, for the button, I should have a name. And let's just give it a name. That's uh, our, our query button. It's for, for querying something. And let's just see what happens when I... I've now just added these form tags around the input field. And it actually it looks the same. Let me just... Oh, you see now something happened. And what did happen? And, th and that's again semantics. I mean, that's just how HTTP works and how the uh, how HTML works in conjunction with HTTP in this case. When when you put this form thing and you have a sub button here with a certain name, then what it does is it loads a new page which has the same name. But now it puts a question mark, and afterwards now come parameters, which are just key value pairs, something equal to something. And the query is just what we wrote here. It's just the name of this button. And uh, I could uh, have several values if I wanted here with just one button. And then it's a uh, ah, search, OK. Did I type search? Now I'm a bit confused why it says search. I wanted blah, blah here. Now what did I do wrong? I mean, that's the... Mm. You have value search there. Maybe that's oh. the reason. Yeah, but the value of the submit button is... Uh, is what uh, is this thing here that it shows? Yeah, I have to tell it that it should. Uh, so how do I do it? I forgot it right now, but certainly on the slides, value. Oh yeah, yeah. This also needs a name. Oh, now I get it. I think this here needs the. I confused this. Okay, it's on the slide. This needs the name and not this one. Yeah, because I, yeah. So I have to put both of them into the form. This will trigger the action here, the submit button. That's why it's type of submit. And then what I, yeah, this here. It will take the contents, the value of this input field, which is what I typed into it. I don't have to restart the server. Let's just do it again, search. And now I get query equals blah, blah. OK, very nice. Uh, but nothing happens. Why doesn't anything happen? Well, I mean, I'm, the server receives this, and, it, and now it tries to find a file with the name search, HTML, query, blah, blah, and it will just say, Actually, yeah, it says 404, right? That's what our server does, 404 not found. We implemented it that way. But actually, that's not what we want, right? What we want, if you receive something like this, that's the semantics in HTTP of the question mark. It actually means this file and then these parameters. So these are now parameters which uh, do something. 
And, and let's just implement that. And for the exercise sheet, you need something very similar. So how do we do that? We're actually very close to this. Oh, and here I'm, I went over the line. This is uh, terrible. <coughs> so where are we? Where do we read our file? Uh, no, I'm in the handle request down here. Okay. We read our file. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before we read the file, we should... Uh, mm. and remove the leading slash. Let's do that right here and you will... then we can just remove that here. And you tell me whether I do something wrong. You think about yourself, how you would do it. Okay, now I first want to see, is there... check whether there are command line... Uh, whether there are arguments after the path. These are called URL arguments. Uh, starting with question mark. Okay, so I just do the following. How do I do it? If path find, we already had something like this. If I find a question mark, and let me even be more specific here. There could be now several arguments. Actually, there's a whole syntax for this. You can look it up, whether there is a URL argument query. Let's just uh, deal with this special case here. Mm. So I'm just checking, is there path find uh, query equals? So that's just... Uh, I'm just checking whether there's something like this and what comes after this. I don't know. Mm. And now what's the best way to now I want to remove it from the fa from the path, and uh, and write this what comes afterward in a variable query. And I wonder how I best uh, do this. Maybe I do it like this. Pos. I just find the position of this. Let me do it like this. And if if it finds this, so if this position is greater is not minus one, then uh, then I just, for the path, I just take everything until that position. Now I'm not sure whether that's the right way to do it. And then the query is everything starting from that position plus seven. That looks like seven letters until the end. <coughs> and. Uh, Mm -hmm. And let's just print this now. And where do I print the path? I sh think I should uh, print the... <coughs> mm -hmm. Now let me print the path here afterwards. And let me print the query here, to just to check whether I have found it query, found query, query. <coughs> Does this look correct? So if I find something there, let's just see whether it happens. I, I will just extract it and remove it from the path so that I return the search HTML and I now have the query. I don't do anything more with the query. Now I have to restart my server. Let's just do it. I have blah blah. I do something. Yeah, that's fine. Now I get the page again, right? It re actually, I should find it here. Found... Ah, but it didn't show me the query. But it did remove it properly, but the query 
I did not extract it properly. What's wrong? Why didn't I? Oh yeah, do you see the mistake? Classical rookie mistake. Yeah, exactly. I should first, I mean, <coughs> first take the part after this and then remove it. Otherwise, it's, uh, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. And <coughs> so, yeah, now I have the query blah blah and I have search HTML. Wonderful. <coughs> And by the way, what I'm also showing you on the side without saying it, now I say it, do it this incremental, right? That's really, don't write a lot of code and then nothing is really hard by itself here, but everything in combination is super complex and so many things go wrong. So don't make the mistake of writing a lot of code and then something goes wrong and you have no idea where it went wrong. So also do it in this piecemeal fashion, that's the right thing to do. So, now if we have a query, now what do we want to do? Here's another trick, and, and that you can also do for the exercise sheet, and I think that's on the last slide. Uh, what do I want? What's the desired behavior or the typical behavior? And, and Google did it like this in the first 10 years. The desired behavior would be now if I type blah blah here, I get the page, the entry page again, and it's empty. What would I like? I would actually like to have the query here, and then I would have the result at the bottom. Th that's what I would like. So let's just do that. So I want to modify the page. How can I do that? Well, I can actually do that pretty easily in my code. So here at this point, uh, if and let's just do it totally hard-coded. If there was a query and the uh, uh, path was uh, search HTML, <coughs> yeah, replace the templates in uh, search HTML. And you will understand in a second what I, so what I do here Actually, I can specify an initial value here, and let me just write some placeholder here. And this actually percentage, this is just something which the server will replace. So that's not, it doesn't have any meaning, it's just something I give it meaning. And let's have here a logical section without any formatting where I will have the result. And now what I will do, I will just replace these placeholders or, yeah, let me just call them placeholders. For search HTML, my, uh, yeah, it will just replace them. My code will just replace them. Let me move this a little bit to the top. So if my page is, and I will only do this for search.html. I mean, this is now hard coding some behavior. And let's just do the following. Okay, I need uh, regular expressions now. In Python, that's called RE. Let's go back to the... Oh, where am I in my file? I'm sorry. Here I am. So now what do I want? In the... I've already read the file. In the file, it's called message. Yeah, it's a bit strange to call it message. I should better call it, yeah, let me call it file contents. We called it message initially, but now the message is always a contents of a file. So let me call it file contents here. So if that was the, then I just take the contents of the file and I replace this placeholder query by the query. And I do this in the file, okay, I need, and I, contents, yeah, 
And I think I need a new line here. Okay. So if it's search HTML and I had a, a query, then I just replace. And actually, it's also fine if the query is empty, then I'm replacing that by empty. So it's actually fine. Let's just check this. I need to, I've changed something in the server, so I need to restart this. So let me just, uh oh, now I have, ah, apparently that didn't work. Oh, okay, I didn't change the result, I just, okay, but let me just, this placeholder is still there, let me do blah blah here, and now the blah blah remains. Actually, it didn't remain, it just produced a new page where it had percentage query percent in here and replaced it by blah blah, exactly by that argument. That's why I did what I did here. Now let's also replace the result by something. So what do we do? Maybe uh, if the query is, uh, is a simple arithmetic expression, evaluate it and show the result. So let's just assume we can type something like 6 times 7 or any other expression. That uh, So how do we do that? If, uh, yeah, let's do the following. If query matches, what what's a regular expression? What do I have? I have the numbers from 0 to 9. I have plus, minus, star, this and maybe spaces, and I have this. Uh, this is just a regular expression. This and I have. S I don't uh, check whether it's well formed. If it matches this, then I do. Result is. Yeah, let me just do eval of uh, query. That's very dangerous. Now I'm executing. Uh, I mean, there could be Python code in here, right? So this is very dangerous. What I calling eval in a program which gets input from somewhere else is, yeah, that's, uh, oh my. But we have a check here. So I think, yeah, I think that's safe, but who knows? But I'm here in my own network. Otherwise, a result is uh, uh, not, invalid. Yeah, let me just show it like this maybe with a format string result. And otherwise I just say invalid expression. And now I do the same thing here. I just use, so, so just that you understand this uh, now I also replace this result. It's really just a placeholder. It's something I did to somehow uh, realize this. And I just replace it with the result. Let's just see how it, whether it works and how it works. And then we are, I think, almost done. Yeah, unable to connect. Ah, str object has no attribute match. Yeah, this was wrong. You didn't tell me. No, I think it has to be rematch. That's strange in Python. You can't do string dot match. You always have to use the name of the regular expression. If regular expression this matches query. I think that's the syntax. Yeah, let's see whether it works. No, it also doesn't work. <coughs> bad character range, plus, minus. Are you still paying attention? There's some, okay, this is not a proper regular expression because there is a minus here and it's taking it literally, I think. Maybe if I take it, put it at the end here, it works. I think that's the reason. Okay, fine. Ah, blah, blah, invalid expression. Let's do two times four. Oh, my. 
invalid syntax. Okay, but now there's a real reason, and this is the last thing we're going to solve, and then we are done. Do you see something? Yeah. You see, in the URL, actually, what I typed, let's do it again. I typed two space star space four. And let's maybe do two plus. That's even nicer. And what it did, when it put it he up here, and that's what the form, let's go back to this once more. That was the magic that happened because of this form. When I click on the submit button, mm -hmm. what this here does it, it reloads the page by appending query equals to what's written in the input field. But what's written in the input field can be anything. And in a URL, you can't have anything. So there's a slide on this. And it's, uh, so there's only a limited character set. It's very limited, allowed in a URL. And in particular, spaces cannot occur in a URL and also a uh, why is the plus okay, yeah? So if you have other characters, you must somehow uh, escape them. You must somehow, and you see how they are escaped here, you must somehow represent them in terms of the allowed characters. And actually, you can see it on the slide. Let's just uh, implement it for now. What happened here? So all the spaces were turned into pluses, and the plus because the plus stands for a space, is turned into percent to b. And I will now just hard code this now, and you can do a similar thing uh, for this sheet, because that's the topic of next week. Let's just, uh, if the query, where did I write the query? Oh yeah, here. Let's just, uh, mm -hmm. let's do some basic uh, URL decoding of the query, and let's be more specific, very basic URL decoding of the query. So let's just uh, substitute any occurrence of uh, plus, and probably I should escape this, I'm not, sh I'm not sure, let's see, by a space. So all pluses, so yeah. It receives two plus percent, two B plus four. The pluses should be turned back into spaces. And the two B, and again, I have to pay attention to the order, two B should be turned into pluses. And let's see whether it works now. Maybe. Nothing to repeat. Oh my. Oh, found query. Maybe I should. Uh, yeah, the, plus the, the plus is the problem. Yeah, I also think I should. I have to escape it here in the regular expression. <laughs> yeah, let's just see whether it works. And then we also. I've moved the. Oh, okay. Wow, it works. Blah, blah. Invalid expression. 6 times 7, 42. Not bad. So, now I think we are done. Yeah, there's just this I mentioned earlier. If you want to reuse the connections or not, you can look at this slide if you have any problems with that. Let me just quickly summarize, quickly go to the exercise sheet, and, and then we are done. So we have now done one whole cycle. We have explained how socket communication between machines work, that the browser is also just one such machine which talks to our server here. And if you follow the right protocol, then you get something which is familiar from, from you using browsers. And here, with these forms, we pressed on the button and then another request was generated with this format and we processed it and yeah and i think you can imagine how that fits with uh, the exercise sheet which i will show you now and the exercise sheet will just be you want a web application let me go back one more time this is your page you style it a bit nicer way maybe not 90s look and feel but at 
at least 2000 look at field, maybe also more modern. Now you can type something here, a prefix, and then you get fuzzy search result of Wikidata entities formatted in a nice way. So the first thing you have to do is like redo everything I've done in the lecture, but do it yourself. Only consult the lecture if you, if you have to or to understand it, but don't just copy blindly from what I did. So much of these 10 points is essentially what I did today. And then, yeah, also implement HTML. You should call it the same, search HTML. We've also basically done this, but now, of course, you shouldn't just evaluate an expression. You should call your fuzzy search, right? Now you're not calling eval on what's written in the field, but you're using your fuzzy search to compute a list of results, which you then show, yeah, and then you should style your page. And let me just remind you, let me maybe go to uh, this page here, that there is a lot more information in the Wikidata file than we used for the, in the Wikidata entities, TN, TSV, than we used in the, in the last lecture. Yeah, maybe just, let's just show the first one. So for the last uh, exercise sheet, you just use the entity names, but there's also, there's a description here, there's a link to the Wikipedia page, there's the name of the Wikidata entity, which also you can use for linking a page. There are synonyms which you can use, you could also already have used those for the last exercise sheet. And there is a link to an image, if an image exists. This column is empty if no image exists. So all kinds of things which you can use for your... And by the way, the images, you also, right? These you can also incorporate them, just so to be clear. You don't need a library or anything, but you, if <laughs> the web server requests an image from us, we can also just, oh, in this case, I think the browser will load it from somewhere else. I don't think you have to serve an image here. But what you can do actually is this uh, fav icon here, which we never read, which is why no little icon here shows in the tab. This you can create too. That's also a little image. Yeah. So there's a lot you can do here to get your points the minimum is described here, you just have to make it a little bit nice and everything, but yeah, this sentence is important. You have two weeks, give free rein to your creativity, and there will be another iteration in the exercise sheet afterwards, exercise sheet seven, where you add JavaScript and make it uh, dynamic and everything. So this will be with us for, for three weeks. I think it's a great exercise sheet where you will learn a lot how this works from the ground up. That's it from my part. Is there any question from, from your part? Um, I have a question about yes. um, the program. Is our program um, capable of having two connections parallel? Because we only have one main loop and if we are serving another computer, are we able to I, 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 I don't think it's so, but... Uh yeah, it's a very good question. It's actually what the last slide was about. Our server, it's a very simple server in many ways. It will only serve one request at a time. And, and this can be a problem because serving the request with your fuzzy search, maybe you type something where it has to compute a lot and then it takes five seconds before it gives the result. If other requests come in in the meantime, they will be ignored or who knows what the browser does. So yeah, there may be problems, but if you handle it properly, the browser will just get no reply for those or it has to wait. So yes, we are not doing, I mean, if you would do it for real, you would have multi-threading, right? Whenever a new connection comes, you would uh, put this in a separate thread and there it is being processed while you can immediately accept new, uh, new requests. But yeah, that's way too much. I mean, you can do it if you like, but I think for the application here, it's not needed. It's also not so hard, I think. But our, as you correctly said, is uh, our, our script is very simple. 
Oh, now something changed. Any other questions? There's a question in the chat. Where do we send topic suggestions for the next lecture? Ah, you mean for the Q&A session? Uh, Natalie, just remind me to send, uh, let's just do an announcement post and then you can just reply to that announcement post with suggestions. So if you have any wishes for the Q&A session on next Tuesday, yeah, you can just write it there. So in the announcement forum, there will be just, I will just write a little post and then you can reply to that. Any other questions for now? Okay, then I hope you have uh, fun with the sheet and see you next Tuesday for the Q&A session. Bye-bye.